Well, to start out talking about the um, the samurai and the code of Bushido, for some reason this thing is being difficult today. Um, I showed you this slide earlier. This is the first shogun in terms of being a military ruler of all of Japan. Uh, by the time that Minamoto took over the Minamoto clan, the um, military ruler, the shogun, really controlled the whole country and the emperor was just a figurehead. And this was true from um, the late 1100s until the mid-late 1800s. So for 700 years, it was a military leader, the shogun, that ran the country. Now, technically, this was not the first shogun because the title shogun, as I mentioned earlier, comes from the word uh, Sai Tai Shogun, which means the grand commander of the expedition against the barbarians. So back in the high end period, in the 700s, 700s and 800s, they actually, the Japanese, had been trying to subdue or conquer two uh, native tribes, that is, uh, tribes of people that were not seen as being Japanese, but they lived in the Japanese islands. They were in the North Island of Hokkaido. They were the Ainu and the Misha, two uh, groups that had refused to come under the authority of the Japanese emperors, and so they sent expeditions to conquer them. Those expeditions, the leaders of those expeditions, were technically the first Chai Tai uh, Tai Shogun, because they really were the grand commanders uh, or chief commander of the expedition against the barbarians. But that title, which came to mean military leader, Shogun, literally means the uh, leader of troops. And so the, the title Shogun was given to um, the Minamoto, the leader of the Minamoto clan, when he defeated the other, uh, the daimyos, the lords, uh, daimyos means great lands, they were the, the primary landholders and the wealthy sort of junior nobility around the country, that each of them had their own military, their own samurai, and they ended up in a warring state when the emperor got very weak and all of them trying to take power and take control. There was a period called the, the Warring States period. and. The victor over all of that, and he did so in the name of the emperor, was um, the the fellow you see here, Minamoto no uh, Yoritomi. Now I talked to Tomo. I talked about that a little bit uh, this morning, but I have to give you a little background because some of you might not have been here, or you may not have remembered it. Maybe you had a nice drink early this afternoon, and that's all gone out of your head now. But um, the idea was that after he defeated all the other daimyos. Many of them expected that he would make himself the emperor, but he didn't. The emperor at that point was in Kyoto, um, and he decided not to interfere with the emperor. But he went back to his home um, and set up what ended up being the real control for the government. He set up all of the um, organized bureaucracy underneath himself that was necessary for him to run the country, and the emperor for the next 700 years was purely a figurehead. There were a couple of times in there when, when the shogunate got shaken up a little bit, but for the most part, the shoguns were in charge. And the reason they were able to be in charge was the warrior class that was beneath them. That is, under the shogun, and the shogun had his own army of samurai, and then under each of the daimyos, um, and I'll show you a chart of that in a minute, uh, they all had their own small armies as well, because the army, the military of the imperial forces had become so weak and was so small that the they no longer could control anything. And so they ended up creating this kind of castle all over. All of the daimyos would have this kind of place as their center. This was both their home and the residence from which they controlled their armies. So these, these are typical Japanese castles, and you'll see some examples of that. If you were just on Okinawa, if you went to the Shuri Castle, that's a completely different design than this sort of thing because the Okinawan castles were based upon the Ryukyu culture prior to Japan being in the Ryukyu Islands. This is what most people think of when they think of the samurai. Uh, the picture on the left here is a samurai in full uh, battle regalia in his armor, as you can see with the helmet and the, you'll notice the two swords here. This is called the Daisho, one of the primary marks of the samurai, and only the samurai were allowed to carry these. Were the long sword, the, the uh, katana, and the short sword, which usually, there are a couple of different versions of it, but was usually the um, uh, wasakashi. 
It's a, a slightly shorter sword, and then they would also carry a knife called the tanto. And only the samurai were allowed to carry these two, these two swords. Daisho literally means long and short, because it was a long sword and a shorter sword. And it was a mark of their um, importance, of their rank in society. They were minor noblemen. The samurai were not common people, they weren't common soldiers, they were noblemen. They were well educated, for instance. A lot of people misunderstand that. They were considered the elite, not only as martial or military leaders, but also as scholars. At one point, because the samurai were universally literate and they actually taught other people to read, uh, Japan at, at one point had a better literacy rate, like in, in the 1600s, it had a higher literacy rate than Western Europe did because primarily of the samurai. Um, the samurai were, the idea of the samurai was that they were supposed to be literate warriors. They were supposed to be scholars. Um, they were highly cultured. Their, the goal was a balance between uh, facility at war and higher learning. And so the samurai were typically very much um, inclined toward the doing of calligraphy, which is a very important art if you had a chance to to see the uh, the gentleman that was doing the you know the calligraphy of people's names upstairs, calligraphy is considered a high art. The samurai practiced that. They also the tea ceremony that is common in Japan was significantly influenced and done for the samurai as a very cultured kind of thing. They were involved in writing poetry, uh, playing music, and study. So they were a very uh, cultured group of people. Uh, in fact, the the idea of poetry, it, when a samurai felt he had been dishonored before committing seppuku, and I'll talk a bit about that, which is the ritual suicide, which allowed one to regain one's honor, because the seppuku, which, or harikiri is what most Westerners know of, but harikiri literally means belly cut. And to open one's own abdomen was both a very painful and a very slow way to die, unless somebody assisted you by cutting off your head or something. And so that's one of the reasons it was considered honorable, is that you did the thing that took a great deal of courage, that you had the self-control uh, and the will to be able to do something like that, and in doing so, you regained your honor that you might have felt you lost because you lost a battle or did not serve your master well or something else. But even that, before committing seppuku, it was standard for the samurai to write a poem, a death poem because they were considered poets as well as military men, and that was very important to them. Um, this period of time um, that they were, the samurai were most powerful uh, or most plentiful, they still were less than 10% of the population. It's not like all the men in, in Japan were part of the samurai um, group. Less than 10% were samurai, and it's estimated that what that meant was that about 1.3 million uh, were considered high samurai. That meant that they both had the right to carry the two swords, the daisho, and they were allowed to ride horses. Ordinary people were not allowed to ride horses. There were about another 500,000 or so that were considered low samurai. They were allowed to carry the daisho, the two swords, but they were not allowed to ride horses. And so there were two classes in the samurai. Altogether, that meant that there were less than 2 million um, samurai out of about 20 million people that were the population of Japan during this period of time. Um, so a lot of people have a misunderstanding about the nature of them. They were a very cultured, uh, low nobility in the samurai. This is an image um, of a major battle that was held, and you get some idea what it would have been like. Most samurai when they fought with other samurai, they were usually fighting on horseback and uh, rather than on the ground, you know, on foot. Although there were, you know, the low samurai would fight on foot because they weren't supposed to ride horses. But this is what an image of samurai battle would, would be like. I'm going to talk in a minute about some of the different weapons. They had uh, a wide variety of weapons, not just the katana, uh, the swords that they used. This shows the both an image of a samurai in his war uniform. This is his combat outfit. But this, if you can read this, this tells you something about the hierarchy, the social hierarchy that was established in Japan during this period of time. 
At the very top, of course, it was the emperor and then the court nobility, but they were really only figureheads. It was only a, a nominal um, or in name only ruling court. Below that, the real authority in the country was the shogun. And under the shogun, there were the daimyo, which were the local warlords, um, that the landowners, that each of them had pledged fealty or loyalty to the shogun, to the emperor as well, but their primary concern was the shogun, because he was the real power. And then underneath that, both an army directly connected to the shogun, but also to the daimyo, were the samurai. And they were the, these three, the shogun, the daimyo, and the samurai, were really the ruling class. Um, the samurai was considered, because they were lower nobility, um, they had the right, for instance, to kill any commoner they felt was not showing them proper respect. And there was no legal violation in doing that. Uh, because below the samurai, you then had peasants, most of whom were farmers, that was the next level, and then craftsmen, those who produced products, and then at the very bottom of the social structure were merchants because the sense that they had was someone who simply bought and sold things did not really contribute all that much to society, and so the merchants were considered the lowest level. Later, after the Meiji Restoration, when they industrialized the country, and the manufacturing of goods became so important, and the need to be able to sell and buy, especially internationally, in order to support that became so important, the merchants very quickly came well up in the scale of things. In fact, many of the daimyo ended up being the heads of large corporations. Um, the, after the industrialization under the Maiji Restoration in the late 1800s uh, and then into the 1900s, they developed what were called zaibatsu, which were uh, giant corporations with multiple kinds of industrial involvements underneath that. So the merchants of the zaibatsu became among the most powerful people in Japan after the Meiji Restoration. But during all of the samurai period, they were considered the very bottom. And the samurai were the low nobility above all the vast majority of the class of people in the country. Okay? This will give you a little bit of an idea about the kinds of weapons, because they were first and foremost, even though they were also scholars and poets and all of that, they were primarily soldiers. And so in terms of military, um, I should say too that the samurai were very much involved in um, the religions of the day, Zen Buddhism especially, they were motivated by Zen, the idea of meditation. Zen Buddhism is a focus on meditation. And we think about the fact that these samurai were involved in um, very dangerous occupations. They personally were constantly involved in battle, which meant that they were endangered personally. And they also ended up doing a lot of killing. Well, the Zen Buddhism, the meditation of that, uh, was very important because it gave a kind of serenity, an ability to sort of philosophically deal with um, the nature of the life that they lived as samurai. So that was very important to them. They were also, um, there were Shinto practices that were involved as well. Um, the idea, and this carries not only the samurai and the seppuku, you know, the suicide in order to retain honor, but also all the way into the kamikazes of the Second World War. In Shinto, you will recall, uh, if you were the earlier lectures, the Shinto believes that um, there are kami or spirits and those kami can attach themselves both to beautiful waterfalls or impressive rock formations, but that great individuals, like the emperor, have an inherent kami, and upon death, that kami will be released into the world, and that that will accrue honor and blessing in the afterlife for a great kami. Well, for in Shinto, if you are a commoner, or you die a, a common death, or you die a, a specifically a dishonorable death of some kind, then you may be sent to Yomi, which is the land of darkness. Everything is cloudy and gray and dark, and it is a very unpleasant place, similar, as I said before, to the Greek idea of Hades. But if you, if you die an honorable death in battle, in defense of your nation or of your emperor or of your lord, whoever your daimyo is, or the, or the shogun, then you can, in your death, or even if you've been dishonored in death, but then you commit seppuku, you regain your honor, and you can uh, then become a great kami. You may be a guardian kami for your nation if you died in defense of your nation or, or, or the emperor, 
And this helps us understand why it seemed during the Second World War, especially when they had tried to adopt the, the Code of Bushido, which we'll talk about, the Samurai Code, that there was such a willingness on the part, and in some cases even an anxiousness on the part of Japanese soldiers to be willing to give their lives. On Iwo Jima, the, the soldiers, the American soldiers on Iwo Jima were astonished the number of times that the Japanese forces would make suicide charges again, right into the weapons. Because once they realized they probably would not be able to succeed, they would rather die an honorable death in order to, to be a, a guardian kami than to simply be defeated and even worse, to be dishonored by being taken captive or having to surrender. Uh, same thing with the kamikazes. So all of this was part of the religious beliefs that they lived under. Now, in terms of the weapons, as I mentioned, um, there were a number of different kinds of bladed weapons they used, the katana, the long sword, the shorter um, um, uh, wakazawi, the tanto, which is the knife they carried. Those, during this period of time, the Japanese became the very best sword makers in the world better than the sword makers in Toledo and Spain and other places that are famous for it. The Japanese perfected the idea of using multiple metals and of um, uh, combining them so that you had a very, very sharp uh, edge to a blade, but you had enough softer steel melded into that that you the, the blades were almost unable to break. It was very difficult to break a quality Japanese sword. Um, in fact, if you ever look at one, you'll see the moiré pattern. You can see the lines where the metals are all uh, uh, combined in there. And it was the com combination of different kinds of metal that both made them phenomenally sharp and also very strong. So oh, sword making was a real art in that time. And, and if you get a sword made by a sword master from Japan, they are very rare and very valuable uh, still to this day. But in addition to that, the, because a lot of the samurai fought from horseback, they used bows. They would use, and you can see that down, perhaps you can see it down here on horseback. Um, they, there's a discipline, a martial discipline within Japan um, called um, Kyudo. And it is the art of archery that was really perfected under the samurai. And if you see a Japanese bow, it looks very strange because they're asymmetrical. The top half of it is twice as long as the bottom half. You know, your hand in a Western bow is in the middle. It's not. And the reason they were made that way is because if you're riding on horseback, having a shorter bottom allows you to fire from horseback, but having a longer top, you still get more strength in the bow in terms of how much force you can put behind the arrow. And so the, the uh, yumi, as it was called, was the bow of the samurai. They also dealt with um, things like um, uh, naginatas, which were pole spears, like a pike, um, these things. And they were very valuable if you were fighting against especially mounted samurai, because it gave you more reach. And it was a powerful weapon against um, soldiers that were with swords because you could, you could strike them before they could get to you. Eventually, they developed, um, I mean, there were a lot of others. They had the staff weapons like bows. They had um, clubs and trenchants, chain weapons. They later on developed a, a matchlock gun called uh, Tanakashima. The Tanakashima was the Japanese matchlock gun. It was like a musket but it literally had a burning fuse on it, so that when you pull the trigger, this burning fuse would light the gunpowder and fire. They were, they were, um, you loaded them in the barrel, so they were very slow, but once those were introduced by the Portuguese in the 1500s, they very quickly went to that, and eventually almost all of the samurai and other military in Japan had gone to firearms instead of to the bow because of the advantage. Plus, they were very easy you have to have some skill with a bow to be able to use one effectively in warfare. You don't have to, you know, if you've got 5,000 people, 10,000 people, or in the case of some battles, 200,000 people, and they've all got you know, firearms, you don't have to be very accurate for that to still be effective in a battle. Um, as I always said, if you can't shoot straight, shoot a lot. <laughs> so that was kind of the principle that they worked under there. Um, in particular also, and you can see this here, they were, extraordinary examples of armor that they used. The armor, called the Yaroi, or Yoroi, 
that the Japanese had was a lamellar armor, which meant they would take pieces of, um, for the less expensive ones, uh, hard leather or even iron at various times. They would use different materials. Sometimes they would use shell, uh, again, early on. They would lacquer those in small pieces so that they had some flexibility and then sew them together with silk thread, which was very strong. And that gave them the ability to fend off sword blows or arrows. Um, later on, they actually, because of firearms, they developed in Japan a version of plate armor like they used in Western Europe, you know, the mounted knights and all that. Um, just the lamellar armor, which is the overlaying pieces that are sewn together, and they would have breastplates and shoulder covers. They would have full helmets like this. Sometimes they would have half helmets where they didn't have the face mask. But the lamellar armor typically would weigh 60 to 70 pounds to carry. And so obviously they always had to have some concern about how much of this can I carry and still be effective because I'm fighting a battle, swinging a sword, using a, you know, using a long weapon, whatever. Um, but the, it was quite impressive, all of the artistic, you will see samurai, uh, if you visit Japan, you will see samurai uniforms, uh, the, the various kinds of armor, and they're extraordinarily uh, beautifully designed. You will get things like, you know, demon faces to try to fight, frighten the enemy and things of that sort. They're beautiful colors because they would lacquer these pieces of either leather or iron or shell in some cases. Uh, in different colors, and then they could put paint designs on them once they were all sewn together, you get some very beautiful uh, kinds of looks from this armor. I want to talk a, a few minutes too about the Code of Bushido, which was the code that they followed. The best parallel to understand what Bushido was all about, and this is two different images, I should have probably put a border in between, on the right-hand side is an image of a samurai warrior killing a dragon. On the left-hand side, there is a western knight killing a dragon. There is a legitimate parallel to be drawn between the western concept of chivalry, like what you read about in the, uh, the various um, stories of saving damsels, killing dragons, the search for the grail, all of that kind of thing, um, and the Code of Bushido obviously had different religious underpinnings, but there is a, a similarity. Chivalry, represented by the armored knights of Western Europe, really developed in a fairly specific way in the 11 and 1200s as not only a military code, but also a moral system. One of the problems that they had in Western Europe, I said this the other day, when you've got a trained military and they have nobody to fight, it's, a, it's almost invariably going to be a problem because if they don't have anybody legitimate to fight, they'll find somebody else to fight. And in Western Europe, early on, they discovered these knights were, were marauding and they were burning villages and killing people. And so the, both the lords and the church in Western Europe came up with very specific rules, what they could and couldn't do, who you couldn't attack, when you couldn't attack. And so those became formalized into a code of chivalry. Particularly, it was developed in the Holy Roman Empire under Charlemagne in France when he became the Holy Roman Emperor in 800, and then later uh, they applied it. The warrior um, ethos, they were to be very disciplined and trained warriors. They were to have a knightly piety. There was supposed to be a religious commitment aspect to what they did. Um, they needed to have courtly manners. They needed to show honor and nobility. They need to be helpful to those who were weaker than them. The idea of uh, oblige, um, uh, noblesse, noblesse oblige. It's coming out wrong. Noblesse oblige, which means the obligation of nobility. That you have a responsibility to help care for those weaker than you or less well off than you was part of the chivalric code because then you, you didn't get to be a knight unless you were of some status in the culture, lower nobility, that sort of thing. Well, on the other side, you have the Bushido. Bushido began to be articulated in the 8th century, but most of it was in the 13th to 16th century when they very specifically started saying, this is what a proper samurai warrior is supposed to be like. First and foremost, there was a sense in which they should have a reckless courage. There are all these quotes in the various writings for the samurai about how if you don't fear, ten men cannot defeat you. You know, a willingness to be able to take on any foe if it was in the right cause. Um, 
the idea of extreme devotion to your family and even more so to your master or lord, whoever it is you have pledged your, your loyalty to, that you would be willing to die at, at any moment if necessary in loyalty and service to whoever your master would be. There was an idea of cultivating the intellect. As I said, they were, they were literate, they were well educated, they were trained in various of the cultural aspects like calligraphy and poetry and that sort of thing. So cultivating the intellect, in fact, it was a, a saying back then, which basically meant the pen and the sword in equal amounts. And that was much of what they felt they were committed to. There was a development of martial arts, of discipline, so that you were, you were able to perform well with the sword or whatever the weapons were, and even in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and indifference to suffering and discomfort a disregard for material wealth. They didn't want, they weren't doing this for money. The samurai were never paid in money. They were given either rice, or in some cases, as they got older, they, their lord might give them a piece of land uh, to own, to have someone farm for them. But they were, there was never to be a concern about material wealth. They should show honor, honesty, compassion, generosity, and self-discipline to those who were on their side. And that's a very important distinction. Because later on, um, the idea of showing compassion to someone who is your enemy, whether male or female, adult or child, was considered a sign of weakness. So there was a kind of a dark side to that as well. Um, it was considered the worst of dishonors to either be um, taken prisoner or to have to surrender to an enemy. And that's why we saw examples in the Second World War, a great many of the military leaders would commit, would commit suicide rather than have to surrender because that's the ultimate dishonor. And seppuppu, you know, the, the uh, cutting of your bowels, literally, was one of the very few ways that you would be seen to regain an honorable death, and that was very important to them. The idea of uh, Bushido, while it followed Zen Buddhism and it followed Shinto, some of the earliest ideas, since much of, the, much of what Japan had had come over from China, the idea of Confucian uh, and I'm going to talk about the religions of Japan tomorrow uh, afternoon, the Confucian ideas, Confucius, Confucius was very concerned about teaching personal responsibility, and particularly that you accept your role in life and perform it well. So the Confucian idea of personal responsibility in your position was very much underneath some of the samurai training. Um, they. They felt, if I am to be a warrior, then I have to be the best warrior that I can be to the point of giving my life, that that's the responsible way to fulfill my position as a samurai in service to my Lord. Um, and again, they felt that Zen Buddhism and Shinto, um, Shinto as well, gave them the wisdom, the serenity they needed, but there was very much a focus on this being the ideal. Uh, one writer about the samurai ethic, the Bushido, said it is shameful for a man to die without having first risked his life in battle. So there was very much this ideal. One list of the various virtues that were appropriate for samurai lists them as righteousness, heroic uh, courage, benevolence or compassion, respect, integrity, honor, and then duty and loyalty. That's what a samurai was supposed to be all about, to the point of death. Okay. On the left here, this is an image of a general who in the 1500s lost a battle and felt by losing he had dishonored his master. It's General Akachi Gidayu. And here he has just written his death poem, which was common, and he is preparing to commit seppuku, which he did. Um, this painting was done of him preparing himself mentally and spiritually for his life to end in order to try to regain honor after having lost a battle for his master. Um, this upper image, again, difficult to see from back there, sorry, but some of the battles, the samurai battles between the daimyos, because the daimyos would get together and you would have multiple daimyos against multiple daimyos and there's various samurai armies, there were battles of as many as 200,000 people. This particular battle, um, the battle of Saikigahara, there were 160 samurai warriors involved in this battle. So there were massive kinds of uh, conflict going on at this time. Again, seppuku was primarily uh, to regain your honor, to be able to enter the afterlife with your honor intact. And it was the fact that it was a very painful and very slow way to die 
that it was seen as being reflective of the ideal of the samurai, that you had self-control, you had courage, you were willing to endure the pain that was involved in this, and it was because of that that seppuku gave you an ability to gain, regain your honor in the afterlife. That was fairly common later on. Um, I don't know if any of you all know the Japanese writer uh, Yukio Mishima. Of course you do. Well, not every, but Americans may not know Yukio Mishima. Uh, he's in college. He was one of my favorite writers. Well, Yukio Mishima was very much a, a Japanese nationalist, and the end of his life, he committed seppuku in public. But he had one of his students standing behind him with a sword, and after his his initial cut, the student at the moment of greatest agony sliced off his head. Now that was fairly common. Uh, to have an assistant or a second, someone who would then relieve you of the pain after you had actually committed the act of, of seppuku. And Yukio Mishima is very famous. This is modern times. I mean, um, 60s, I think it was, um, that he he committed seppuku uh, in protest to some of the things that were happening in Japan at that time uh, because he was very much a traditionalist. But his writing is extraordinary. The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea, you know that? that? That's a Mishima book. Um, so. So we still, you know, there are still people committing seppuku today, although certainly not as common as it was. At the end of the Second World War, there was a lot of that sort of thing. Um, St. Francis Xavier, the famous Jesuit uh, missionary who came to Japan in the 1500s, spent a couple of years there, planted some Catholic missions, which later were destroyed in the anti-Christian uh, and anti-foreigner kind of movements under the Tokugawa um, shogunate. But Francis Xavier once said, the Japanese, uh, he's referring to Japan, he said, there is no nation in the world that fears death less. <laughs> to go to an honorable death was considered the greatest, the greatest possible thing that one could do if you were samurai. Um, now, the samurai, there are no samurai anymore. Oh, come on. There we go. The decline of the samurai really started with the Meiji Restoration. You will remember that two of the daimyo, remember if you listened to my earlier lectures, two of the southern daimyo, the Chosin and the Satsumo daimyos, decided that the, the Tokugawa uh, shogunate needed to be gotten rid of and that the emperor should be put back in power after 700 years of just being a figurehead. So they got other daimyos and their armies to join them, and they ended up defeating the Tokugawa shogun. He was thrown out of power, and they then it's called the Meiji Restoration because they restored the authority and power of the Meiji emperor, who was just a, a teenager when, because right in the process of this war going on, uh, the old emperor died, and his son, who was in his late teens, ended up stepping into the role. He ended up being an extraordinary leader uh, in terms of developing Japan, uh, industrializing it, modernizing it, doing all those things that couldn't be done during the Tokugawa shogunate because they had isolated themselves from the rest of the world. Well, unfortunately for the samurai, one of the things that the emperor, uh, the Meiji emperor did was he did away with the whole class structure. Um, there were only two categories of people um, after the Meiji emperor changed the feudal, it, he got rid of the feudal system. There were no longer, there were only free men and slaves. And the difference in freemen was primarily just based upon your station in life, whether you had wealth or whatever. But it, you did not have this shogun, daimyo, uh, samurai, peasant. Um, uh, what's that? And then merchants at the bottom, right? The craftsmen's in the middle, and then the merchants at the bottom. Uh, you didn't have that anymore. And the samurai, their rights as, as minor noblemen were taken away. They were no longer allowed to carry the swords, the katana. They were no longer allowed to kill commoners without being found guilty of murder. Um, they were no longer allowed to wear the top knot, the unique hairdo that the samurai were known for. The, in fact, they were no longer to, able to use the title samurai. They were called shizoku after that. And they were, they were given a sort of a retirement, but for economic reasons, after giving a, a promise sort of retirement over a period of time, the government ended up giving most of them a one-time buyout. And since the samurai had never really managed money or business, that was not something they were concerned about. Most of them lost what they had pretty quick and ended up having to 
become weavers or farmers, uh, you know, working in the land, something that would have been considered completely inappropriate. In fact, prior to the Meiji Restoration, it was illegal for a samurai to do something like become a weaver. They actually, when they discovered the problem that all these samurai were having, the Meiji um, era, they had to pass laws that not only made it okay for samurais to be involved in that kind of work, but even to encourage them in it, to, it, to officially recognize that there was honor for a samurai to produce woven materials or whatever else it was they might be doing. Um, even the title uh, Shizoku, which was used for the samurai, was legally done away with in 1947 because of the effort by the Imperial Japanese military to take the, the Kota Bushido and the samurai ethic and use it as a, as a justification for their militaristic efforts in the Second World War. So even that was taken away from them at that point. So there was a radical decline in the samurai. Now some of them did move over and become part of the regular military, you know, of the, of the government. Um, many of them, as I say, had to become farmers or do other things because there were too many of them to fill the ranks of what was already an existing army by that point. Um, so you have these images of very old men who had been powerful warriors and samurai in their day. Boy, this thing is stubborn. These two images, I just want to talk for a couple of minutes now about modern Bushido, what has happened. The Japanese military, following the end of the samurai, they tried to claim that all of the military of the Imperial Japanese Army, the Imperial Japanese Navy, that all of them had inherited the code of Bushido and that they were to follow it. And so into World War II, this is much um, the, the unbelievably aggressive kind of dedication that the military had, the Japanese military in the Second World War, is based upon the fact that they were claiming the recall to the Code of Bushido. And what that meant to them was first dedication to the emperor. The reason why so many of the Japanese did not want to um, accept the surrender is because they believed that the Allies, especially the Americans, would put the emperor aside, deny him his authority and, he, and his divinity especially, and force them to uh, completely change the, the monarch system where they had an emperor who was perceived as being a great kami, a god, sort of a, you know, a minor god, a minor deity, and they were unwilling to accept that because of dedication of the emperor. It turns out that, as I said to a couple of people before, I'm not a huge fan historically of Douglas MacArthur, but one of the things that he did very well was the way he treated the emperor, like re refusing to allow him to be um, to be tried for war crimes or for any investigation into his involvement in any of that, because he knew that if they did something to di to diminish or to um, make less credible the emperor, then they would have another uprising on their hand. And he was very wise about that. And many of the Japanese, when he saw they saw that. The emperor was allowed to retain his title and his position. He was treated with respect. He still had to follow the direction of the Supreme Allied Commander and the, and the occupation forces. But the emperor was very important. And the reason why there were a number of uh, coup attempts, even after the emperor, they, people said the emperor must have been forced to say that. And so a lot of people tried to prevent the Japanese from actually surrendering, even after the emperor said we were surrendering is because they assumed that the emperor would be set aside and they were unwilling to accept that because dedication of the emperor was a big deal. Um, the, the Japanese military, again into the Second World War, believed that defeat was shameful, better to die in battle than be defeated. They believed that surrender was dishonorable and so you should never be surrender, uh, never surrender or should never allow yourself to be captured. For instance, the Battle of Okinawa that I talked about, the, uh, the Japanese started out with about 120,000 uh, soldiers on that island. Only 7,000 of them were captured at the end. All the others either were killed in battle or committed suicide, many of them by jumping off of cliffs um, on the island. So surrender was dishonorable. Um, they believed that it was weakness to show any compassion to an enemy, men, women, or children. Showing compassion to an enemy was weakness, which is one of the ways that they justified some of what ended up, by any account later on, being recognized as atrocities, as war crimes. 
because um, you were not to show compassion to your enemies. They, they were your enemy. And they, now much of this I don't believe is consistent with the original Code of Bushido that the samurai followed, but this is how it got interpreted in the militaristic kind of environment of the Japanese army in the Second World War. And they believe that anyone who surrendered for any reason was deserving of nothing but contempt. There was no legitimate reason to ever surrender or be captured. And so there could only be contempt for them. The Soviet Union did a similar thing after they lost hundreds of thousands of soldiers early in uh, Operation Barbarossa when the, when the Nazis betrayed the, the treaty they had with Russia and invaded Russia. In the first few months, hundreds of thousands of Russian military were taken captive. And Joseph Stalin declared that being captive was a, uh, being taken captive was an act of treason, and any of them that tried to return home would be executed. Um, so, a similar kind of attitude toward what it meant to surrender. It's also how we understand the kamikazes and what they their mindset. Even though many of them we know now from what the letters they left behind went not because of a sense of this kind of uh, military code, but rather because they felt they were ordered to and they had to. But many of them did volunteer uh, willingly and give their lives in suicide attacks, believing that they were fulfilling the kind of code of honor uh, in defending the emperor and defending their nation that was called for. Um, and so initially when they called for volunteers for these special attack units, they were called these suicide attack units, they had more volunteer pilots, even though most of them weren't very well trained at that point, but they had more volunteer pilots than they had airplanes. So there were a lot of people in the Japanese military that were inclined to want to do this. Um, and interestingly enough, the same sort of code of Bushido, of commitment to those to whom you owe loyalty, has been used by Japanese companies to get more work out of their employees. I mean, you've all read the stories or seen the pictures about uh, Japanese employees who work 20 hours a day who uh, have to, the only time they get to sleep is when they're on the train going to and from work, and they work seven days a week, and it's this astonishing level of commitment they have, and most of them, uh, until fairly recently, this has changed some recently, they would have a job for life. I mean, they would work for the same company forever. They had a loyalty to it, and the company had a loyalty to them. But this idea of really giving everything you have and having a dis almost military discipline to doing the work and being loyal to the company is a direct extension uh, in modern Japanese business from the time of the samurai in Bushido. Um, some authorities have said that the Code of Bushido and the effort of the, uh, the army, the Japanese military in the Second World War to follow it actually probably ended up hurting them because many times rather than finding a more productive solution of uh, the idea of a suicide charge in order to give our lives for the emperor of the nation may not have been the most effective way to fight a war. And so perhaps if they had found other ways to address that, not driven by this code, they may have been more successful in some cases, although they were astonishing success, astonishingly successful for the first, couple, uh, first 18 months or so. So that's the samurai and the code of Bushido. Are there any questions? Down here first and then there. Yes? Was the samurai class hereditary? Uh, could you only be a samurai if your father was a samurai, or were there other interests? No, it was um, it was hereditary. They much of the loyalty they had to their daimyo was because they were of that clan, and so it, they were they were a the minor nobility, and so someone who was from a peasant class was there was not the opportunity. Now there are extreme examples of people who did break those barriers, but very few, and that's why we know about some of them. You know, some peasant who was supposed to just be a weapons carrier for for his his samurai lord, and then in the middle of the battle, he ends up you know, fighting for his lord and being very successful, and they promote it. I mean, there are examples of that, but for the most part, no. The, they had to be part of the nobility, um, of the samurai class, and usually they were part of the clan. There was a phenomenon, by the way, called ronin, which you may have heard of, which a ronin is a samurai without a master, without a lord. Um, there's a wonderful story, uh, I was talking about this earlier, this, the story of the 47 Ronin, the most popular uh, story in Japanese history or legend. In fact, there have been dozens of books and stories and movies about this, the 47 Ronin. What happened was their lord, um, their daimyo, was um, 
offended at a gathering of lords by another lord who was actually his superior and so he just blasted him you know he blew up at him which was considered a dishonorable act well the shogun said for that you have to commit seppuku well his samurai the 47 samurai that were closest to him felt like this was unfair, that their lord had been provoked, but because he was an obedient servant of the, of the shogun, their lord committed seppuku, suicide. Well, so there's 47 ronin now, meaning 47 who no longer have a master. They didn't do anything right away. They waited almost two years, and then after that period of time, they went to the home of this other daimyo that had caused that they felt unfairly caused the death of their lord and they killed him uh, in his bed and then they turned themselves into the authorities and said we've just killed him well this is an interesting story and it's always fascinating the japanese because on the one hand these uh ronin were guilty of violating the code of bushido because they committed murder against someone in their bed in their bed who was fairly defenseless at that point. They didn't meet him in battle. But on the other hand, they absolutely exemplified the loyalty to their lord that is so even more critical to the Code of Bushido. So because of the crime, and they turned themselves in immediately, they didn't try to get away. The, the story of the 47 Ronin has always fascinated people because um, the decision of the authorities were that the 47 Ronin were, be, were allowed to commit seppuku rather than be executed, which would have been dishonorable. And so they all committed suicide. And you can go to the site of the, um, you were mentioning it's a Tokyo temple, that they have the burial place of the 47 Ronin. This is a real historical act, uh, event, but then it also has become part of the literature and the culture and everything else. So this, the, the very complicated idea that on the one hand they committed an act of murder and then turned themselves in for it, which is not consistent, but then they did so out of motivation of being completely loyal to what they thought was uh, to their lord, their master, their daimyo, that they felt had been wrongly uh, uh, forced to commit seppuku himself. So, yeah, but they, so that's what a ronin is, if you ever see that. Yes? Yeah. Who paid for all this? I mean, were there taxes? Who levied taxes? I mean, all this guy just did everything for free. Well, they actually didn't get paid. They got paid in food, and they got paid in services. Exactly. Well, the um, we talked about this a little bit earlier in one of the lectures that the, the government at a certain point that under the Taito um, um, policies, they took all of the land and they claimed all of the land. It you know there was no private ownership of land initially when they started this. All of the land belonged to the state, uh, which meant it all belonged to the emperor, and it would be it was divvied out various rice paddies, a certain amount of property, was given to each male. In fact, at age six, every male was given a certain allotment that they then would be able to harvest for their whole lifetime. They would keep most of it, some of it would go back to the emperor, and then there was also a cash payment, a, t a head tax, that had to be paid every year. Well, because the government, the imperial government started getting really lazy and they no longer were paying the bureaucrats to go out and manage all this, their tax managers, they started depending upon the daimyo to collect the taxes. And the daimyo collected the taxes by using their samurai, and that's one of the reasons the samurai armies built up. So the daimyos would take part of what they claimed in taxes and give it as payment in food, in rice, to the samurai and they could eat part of it, sell part of it, and then they also would provide the samurai with labor. The peasants and slaves that were under the daimyo, they would require that they spend a certain amount of time in public works and a certain amount of time serving the needs of the samurai. So if this, and eventually some of the samurai were given plots of land as they got older, and so the peasants would have to work the land for those samurai. So there was a system for paying for all of this using the taxes that were drawn from the, the produce of the land back to the imperial government, okay? Did you have a question a second ago and I overlooked you? Sorry. No problem. Um, uh, James Clavell's book, Shogun, uh, some of the characters were women or samurai. How, how accurate is that? How prevalent is that? There were women samurai, certainly not many of them. In fact, there's one very famous woman samurai, Tomi, who, her name is longer than that, that's part of her name. Um, she, in full battle regalia, with a mask and everything, challenged 
a leader of a, another samurai army to individual combat in order to determine a value, uh, the, uh, who was going to win, right? This is something they did in Japan as well as in other places. Well, she ended up defeating him in a sword battle. She didn't kill him, but he was wounded, and so he withdrew, and she takes her mask off, and they see that she's a woman. Well, the guy immediately kills himself because he's been defeated by a woman. <laughs> And she ended up being a very significant warrior. She ended up being the consort, although she was a warrior, to the local prince. And the two of them ended up being um, falling out of favor. Someone else, you know, the, took over, and they were on the run. And so she ended up sacrificing herself in order to be able to save her lover, who was the prince, allowing him to escape. And so there are great stories about all of that. So yes, there were women samurai, but again, just like there being a non-noble samurai, it was very, very rare um, and not to be expected. Okay? Yep. Any other questions? Here? Oh, yes. Where did ninjas come into all this? Ninjas. <laughs> ninjas were during the same period of time that the, um, the samurai were developing. The ninjas were a very special kind of warrior that were, um, they were spies, they were considered very secretive, and they also were assassins. See, the samurai, part of their whole code of Bushido is that you stand up and face your enemy and you fight a fair fight. The ninjas were recruited in an effort to do uh, quite the opposite, to be subversive, to sneak into areas and kill people in their beds. This is why it was considered dishonorable and a, and a real crime for the 47 Ronin to kill the opponent in his bed, because that's not the sort of thing that samurai should do. That's what the ninjas might have done. So they were assassins, they were spies, they did secret missions, um, and they didn't all dress in black with you know masks and whatever. In fact, one of the things that they were most famous for is that you couldn't tell a ninja that they were, um, they blended in. And so you were never sure um, you, you know, you'd be surprised that someone who looked like just an ordinary Joe ended up being a secret agent for the Shogun or the Emperor at one point. Any other questions? Yes? What are the origins of sumo? My brother is a sumo addict, and every time he goes to Japan, at 5 o'clock, they show the sumo wrestling, but I don't know where it started. I, sumo wrestling. How did that start? How did two great big fat guys in diapers end up wrestling, okay? I really, I, I know just a tiny bit about it, not enough to really speak to it, but let me look it up and we'll talk about it. You know, I'll, I'll bring it up in the next one. But in fact, we were in um, the museum, the Okinawa Prefectural Museum yesterday, and there was a sports page there. And on one, once that, that was upside down, the woman had been reading it, and on one side there were base, photos of baseball, and the other side was, was a photo of uh, sumo wrestling, and so it was a report on you know, sumo. Um, it, it too is a cultural phenomenon. Um, and so I'll, I'll come back and give you a little bit more on that because I don't feel adequate to that right now. Thank you. Yes? How did you go from being a low samurai to a higher samurai? I honestly don't know. I think some of it had to do with where you fell in the class structure. You know, even though it was all lower nobility, um, the there were obviously some that were more you know, of, of higher rank than others. Um, so I, d I think it probably had to do with something with where they fell in terms of their level of nobility within the samurai, but I don't know that for a fact. 